and bless productive 2018. I believe this is the first time we have gathered since the opening of the new year. Further, let me take this opportunity to wish everyone and St. Lucia a happy 39th Independence anniversary and celebrations. I am in receipt of communication from the Honorable Member for Suazel, Saltibus, informing of his unavailability. He is unable to be here with us today as he is out of state on government business. Statements by Ministers. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, um, I just really want to stand um, and continue your acknowledgement with regards to the 30th, 39th independence of St. Lucia. And I want to acknowledge this great milestone that St. Lucia has achieved and for us to recognize the progress that we have made as a country. And more importantly, I'm appealing to all St. Lucians um, to actively participate in a list of independence activities that we have outlined for this year. And in particular, to the young people of St. Lucia to solicit their involvement in civil society. A great nation can only be successful when its citizenry participates in the process and engages itself in the development of our country. And I feel that the 39th year is a great opportunity for us to celebrate and recognize the incredible achievements that we have made as a country. And sometimes we get the impression that people have become cynical about politics, become cynical about its own country. And to say that this is our country, this is our St. Lucia, and it requires of us all to participate, and that to recognize that the change that is necessary can only come about by engagement. And I often say to many St. Lucians who say that they're so disgusted with the process that we have that they prefer to absent themselves from elections, as an example, Madam Speaker. And I say to them that when you don't vote, you still have voted. Because whoever the majority has voted for ends up becoming your selection. And while it is difficult sometimes to reconcile yourself to two choices in terms of political parties, one has to be able to make a choice in terms of what is the best way forward. And so I'm hoping that many solutions will take this opportunity of our independence to continue to reflect on the progress that we've made, Madam Speaker, but more importantly, to reflect on how they can participate and continue to make St. Lucia the best place to live, the best place to work, the best place for people to come in vacation. And so I want to thank all the solutions for their support, their participation, and encourage many more people to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with Responsibility for Tourism, Information and Broadcasting. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just rise to report to this Parliament um, and to uh, inform the Parliament, really, about the record-breaking uh, year that we had in 2017 as it pertains to tourism arrivals to our shores. Madam Speaker, to many you would have seen the cruise ships not only increasing in size but increasing by the number of calls and visits that they made to our destination. Stayover arrivals, Madam Speaker, or the arrivals coming to stay in hotels created history by generating for the first time in our history 
a 386,127,000 visitors, or an 11% improvement, Madam Speaker, over 2016, while the cruise sector yielded 668,303 visitors, or a 14% increase over the same period in 2016. Yacht arrivals, Madam Speaker, also had encouraging numbers at 48,739 visitors. Madam Speaker, this gives us a total of 1,103,169 visitors combining the various subsectors in the tourism industry. Madam Speaker, all of our major markets performed phenomenally. Uh, including the United States leading the way uh, with very strong growth returning to Canada and the United Kingdom. I rise most importantly, Madam Speaker, to say that this government will be doing everything in its power to ensure that we encourage St. Lucians to maximize the economic opportunity that tourism presents. In many ways, Madam Speaker, this will be the year of linkage for our government as our policy shifts towards increasing more sites and attractions, encouraging St. Lucians, Madam Speaker, to continue growing the number of non-traditional accommodations in terms of villas and apartments that are on Airbnb, Expedia, and Booking.com and other online platforms, Madam Speaker. We are, Madam Speaker, undertaking the process as well to reconfigure the institutional arrangements that govern the tourism sector. Madam Speaker, to this end, we have made a tremendous headway in uh, trying to establish the National Tourism Council, which will encourage, Madam Speaker, greater cohesion in the management of the tourism industry as we seek to encourage greater levels of participation and uh, greater levels of cooperation between departments in the civil service and the private sector. Madam Speaker, we are also of the view that the time has come for us to better utilize the potential of our villages and towns. And so, Madam Speaker, you would have heard us speak, saying and making pronouncements about the establishment of village tourism. And I want to uh, assure this Parliament that we have made significant headway in advancing the establishment of the new entity Village Tourism Incorporated, which we hope will be established by the third quarter of this year. Madam Speaker, everything that we do and everything that we are attempting is with one aim, and that is to ensure that the people of St. Lucia benefit in a greater way than they have in previous years from the tourism sector. I thank you. Honorable Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'd like to make a statement on the River Dory Development Project. This project, this project started, the River Dory Development Project started in 2010 under the former UWP administration and under the then Minister of Housing, Richard Frederick. An agreement was signed on the 22nd of June. Excuse me, please, Honorable Minister. Um, I'm sure you recognize that there is a feedback. So can we try to see what is happening? It's coming through. I recommend so. Okay. 
The River Dory Development Project started in 2010 under the former UWP administration and then Housing Minister Richard Frederick. An agreement was signed on the 22nd of June 2010 between the NHC and Master Builders as the contractor. It was to develop 58.21779 acres of land at a contract price capped at about $16 million. On June 6, 2012, an agreement was signed to nullify the agreement between NHC and Master Builders with the intention of entering into a new agreement with NHC Bo for the completion of the works. It is evident that the new government in 2012 entered into an agreement with a UK-based company. This is an unusual agreement, Madam Speaker, because Bo became a 51% shareholder of the 58 acres of land of the River Dory Development Project. They became a 51% shareholder, but did not attain or apply for an alien land holding license, which is a requirement for anybody owning or any foreign company owning the majority shares in a land development project. No deposit was made by Bo, yet they own 51% of the River Dore development project, which if calculated into acres, would account for about 30 acres of the development. The government of the SLP transferred the land to Bo and turned around and engage lawyers to try and get the land transferred back to the government. So, Madam Speaker, that is why I said it was an unusual arrangement because here was the land owned by the government, transferred to an entity, and then lawyers engaged to get the land back to the government. Several different lawyers appear to have been engaged and thousands of dollars was paid, but was not successful in getting the land transferred back to the government of St. Lucia or to the NHC. Madam Speaker, the NHC is being sued for unpaid infrastructure works costing $5,466,000 $423.54 relating to the River Dora, River Dora project. The 58 acres of the housing development project. In 2012, the joint venture company, NHC Bo St. Lucia Limited, and master builders was informally permitted to continue with infrastructure works originally contracted or commissioned by the NHC. The letter transformed into the NHC being indemnified from claims by Master Builders Group Limited. However, a contract was never secured from the joint venture for continuing with the scope of infrastructure works estimated to cost about $16 million. After unsuccessful attempts to seek payment arrangements from both NHC and its joint venture, legal proceedings was launched against the NHC. Madam Speaker, it gets more interesting from there. The court has granted an inhibition order in favor of master builders 
prohibiting any activity or transfer of interest on the property without due regard for the interest of claim by Master Builders Limited being first considered. In seeking an expedient solution, an unsuccessful attempt was made to have the court set aside the matter. So in all of the thousands of dollars we were paying to the lawyers, and Madam Speaker, I've refrained from mentioning who the lawyers were in this chamber, but the documents can be presented to show who the lawyers are. A mediation agreement was obtained at the hearing of May 9, 2016. A recommendation was made to be compensated to the extent of $4 million plus 6.5 acres of land yet to be ratified by the incoming board. The matter was due for hearing in September 2016, by which time the current NHC administration had to respond. Now, in this case, I have to mention names, Madam Speaker, because that is the report submitted to me on the matter. The managing director, and that's in the minutes of the NHC board meeting, the managing director and the attorney, René St. Rose, had since appraised the minister of this priority matter with subsequent meetings to be held. And I happen to have been the minister who was appraised at the time. In 2012, to put it in order, Madam Speaker, in 2012, the NHC completed the formation of the joint venture which was initially being pursued by the former NHC administration leading up to the elections of November 2011. With the formation of the company, the NHC was afforded 49% share of the ownership while both panel systems was awarded 51%. As per agreement, upon committing the land, there was to be a compensatory arrangement wherein the developer, both panel systems, would place in escrow the raw market value of the land in the joint venture being in receipt of the property. The land measuring 58 acres was to exclude the six acres of land already occupied by the farmers. So, Madam Speaker, the arrangement was the land had to be valued, and before the transfer was made, the value of the land had to be deposited in an escrow account. We have not found this escrow account. We don't know whether it exists but we cannot find any money deposited anywhere, yet the land was transferred. It also included plus extraction of reserved portions of land upon which the estate house existed to be vested into the St. Lucia National Trust. Needless to say, the entire property with no escrow account as per agreement being satisfied. Disagreements between directors and failure by Bopanel to capitalize the project prompted the need for legal action. Peter I. Foster and Associates has been proceeding to dissolve the company and to seek from the courts the property being returned to the state. Attorney Gerald Ald Williams is representing the NHC interest in the joint venture. Success in the NHC recovering the assets hinge on the outcome of the current NHC versus Master Builders court case in which the inhibition by the court over the entire 48 acres has been registered. 
So the entire 58 acres is tied up in that arrangement. Madam Speaker, what is interesting is the pricing. It appears that nothing changed in the scope of works of the project after the joint venture. But the price increased by $4 million. So the original contract that was signed between NHC and Master Builders, nothing changed in the scope of works when Bow Panel became part of the arrangement. But it turned out that the revised contract price had increased by $4 million. In the first contract arrangement, it was costing $6.96 per square foot of land developed, land to be developed. Compare this, Madam Speaker, to six years later, when the forestry housing development was developed, was undertaken, and the, the price per square foot was just over $5 for development cost. But the revised project cost on the NHC bow had gone up to $8.75 per square foot of land to be developed with no change of scope of works. Today, Madam Speaker, the government has been ordered by the courts to pay almost $7 million towards this arrangement. And here's the letter that I received, Madam Speaker, from the lawyer representing Master Builders. It says, Dear Minister Joseph, we continue to act herein on behalf of the claimant Master Builders, Company Limited. We write to you in your capacity as Minister with Responsibility for the National Housing Corporation. We hereby request settlement of all monies indisputably owing to the client in respect of infrastructural works carried out at the River Dore project in the joint venture in the quarter of Labri for and on behalf of NHC and the benefits of the joint venture company, NHC Bow St. Lucia Limited. Within 14 days thereof, these monies have been outstanding since 2012. Our client's claim is for the sum of $6,149,000 $779.38 pursuant to, ex to extend judgment of the High Court dated 25th March 2016 and filed on the 26th of March 2015 and broken down as follows. Principal judgment sum, 4898000 $355.90. Cost of judgment, $3,010.50. Interest on judgment at a rate of 6% per annum for from the 2nd of May 2012 to the 31st of August 2016, 1000 538 days at an interest payment of $805 per day. $805.21 per day. A total of $1,238,412.98. Madam Speaker, this is as a result of the government refusing to acknowledge that work had been done and the work had to be paid for. That was the government that came into office after the election of 2011. What has resulted, Madam Speaker, is a court judgment 
where with all apart from the six million plus that we are required to pay madam speaker several thousands of dollars had been paid to many different lawyers to undo what the government had done today madam speaker we are in the process with the ministry of finance to be able to secure the money to pay we have made a part payment and i can declare to this honorable house and the people of saint lucia that the land has been returned to the full ownership of the people of St. Lucia. I thank you. Do you have sufficient copies of the Sarge, can you make copies available, please? <clears throat> Honorable members, at this juncture, I wish to inform the parliament that um, you will not for the first time that there are no recording secretaries on the floor of the chamber. This is because the recording system has been elevated to one that the transmission is being sent directly to the secretary's computers downstairs. So this is a milestone for us. <laughs> And hopefully the idea is um, honorable members can be in receipt of, um, of Hansard's, we are hoping, um, not instantaneously, but it should speed up the process tremendously. <laughs> Papers to be laid. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 122 of 2017, Fiscal Incentives E&D Network Trading Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 125 of 2017, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 9 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 127, of 2017, value added tax, deferred payment <coughs> of value added tax for importation of capital goods and raw materials, regulations. Statutory instrument number 128 of 2017, fiscal incentives, Bon Baguette Bakery Limited, order. Statutory instrument number 129 of 2017, fiscal incentives, Technics Construction Incorporated, order. Statutory instrument number 130 of 2017, fiscal incentives, Hotel Chocolat Estates Limited order. Statutory instrument number 131 of 2017, Non-Governmental Organizations Act commencement order. Statutory instrument number 133 of 2017, excise tax amendment of schedule one number 10 order. Statutory instrument number 136 of 2017, fiscal incentives, Dr. Freezer's Ice Cream Parlor and Fast Foods Limited, order. Statutory instrument number 137 of 2017, airport service charge amendment regulations. Statutory instrument number two of 2018, excise tax amendment of schedule one, number one, order. Statutory instrument number three, of 2018 health practitioners amendment schedule order statutory instrument number four of 2018 millennium heights medical complex act commencement order statutory instrument number five of 2018 legal profession eligibility cara carissa shilling shilling and ford order 
Statutory Instrument Number 7 of 2018, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 2 Order. Office of the Director of Audit, Performance of Audit Report on the Boitawange Bridge, December 2016. And Financial Services Regulatory Authority, Annual Report, 2017. Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Fiscal Planning, Natural Resources, and Co-op. Madam Speaker, I beg to present the following paper standing in my name. Banana Industry Trust Corporation, financial statement for the year ending March 31st, 2015. Banana Industry Trust Corporation financial statement for the end of the year 31st March 2016. And Banana, Banana Industry Trust Corporation company number 2011-C367 financial statement for the year ending March 31st 2017. Honorable Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 126 of 2017, Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic, Public Omnibus Fares, Amendment Regulation, Statutory instrument number eight of 2018, motor vehicle and road traffic designation of an inspector's order. Honorable Prime Minister, Madam, and business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers in the name of the Minister of Commerce, Industry, Enterprise, Development, and Consumer Affairs. Statutory instrument number 123 of 2017, Invest St. Lucia, Opica, Viewport, Vesting Order. Statutory instrument number 124 of 2017, Price Control Amendment number 18, Order. Statutory instrument number 132 of 2017, Price Control Amendment number 19, Order. Statutory instrument number 1 of 2018, Price Control Amendment Number One Order, Statutory Instrument Number Six of 2018, Price Control Amendment Number Two Order, Statutory Instrument Number Nine of 2018, Invest St. Lucia Shock Cast Trees Vesting Order, Statutory Instrument Number Ten of 2018, Invest St. Lucia Lafag Choisel Vesting Order, Invest St. Lucia Annual Report 2016. And the St. Lucia Export TIPA, Trade Export Promotion Agency, Annual Report April 2016 to March 2017. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information, and broadcasting. Madam Speaker, I wish to lay the following papers in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 134 of 2017. Tourism Incentive, Genesis Casino, St. Lucia Limited, order. Statutory Instrument Number 135 of 2017, Tourism Stimulus and Investment, Anola Visit Villas Limited, order. Motions. Honorable Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow by means of advances sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sums shall be charged 
and paid out of the consolidated fund. Pardon me, sir. This is a motion. You have to read it in entirety. Madam Speaker, this motion is seeks a resolution. My apologies, Madam Speaker. Whereas it is provided by Section 38.1 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 1501, that the Minister for Finance may, by resolution of Parliament, borrow money from a bank or other financial institution by means of advances to an amount not exceeding in aggregate the sum specified in the resolution to meet current requirements and such resolution shall not have effect for any period exceeding six months. And whereas it is further provided by Section 38.2 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 1501, that the power conferred on the Minister of Finance to borrow money by means of advances from a bank may be exercised by means of a fluctuating overdraft. And whereas it is further provided by Section 421 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 1501, that all debt charges for which the government is liable shall be charged and paid out of the consolidated fund. And whereas the Minister of Finance deems it necessary to borrow my means of advances and from commercial banks sums not exceeding $55 million as follows. The Royal Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, $2.2 million. Royal Bank of Canada, $2.8 million. First Caribbean International Bank, $4 million. Bank of Nova Scotia, $6 million. First National Bank of St. Lucia Limited, $2.5 million. And Bank of St. Lucia, $37.5 million. Be resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow by means of advances sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months and from the date thereof and which sums shall be charged and paid out of the consolidated fund. Honorable members, The question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow by means of advances sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sum shall be charged on and paid out of the consolidated fund. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The resolution seeks primarily parliamentary approval for the government of St. Lucia to borrow by means of advances to facilitate the renewal of the overdraft facilities. Madam Speaker, the subsequent parliamentary approval, the aforementioned resolution, lapsed on January 3rd, 2018, and in order that the government can legally access short-term borrowing to meet current requirements, it has become necessary to obtain parliamentary approval through a new resolution. Um, given the current con requirements of the short-term forecast of government's operating expenditure, including monthly salaries and the anticipated usage of the overdraft facility, the Ministry of Finance is of the view that $55 million limit is more than adequate. Accordingly, the Ministry proposes the following overdraft limits at the various banks of commercial banks. We've indicated the Royal Bank of Trinidad, the Royal Bank of Canada, First Caribbean International Bank, the Bank of Scotia, First National Bank of St. Lucia, and the Bank of St. Lucia, and there would be $55 million in total. The overdraft facility is expected to generate an average interest cost for the financial year of approximately $500,000, which represents a cost of less than 1% of the facility. The overdraft borrowing by the government attracts an interest ranging from 10% to 11.5% per annum at various commercial banks. However, the advent of the regional government securities market Government has been able to borrow short-term funds by issuing Treasury bills. Government of St. Lucia Treasury bills has been able to attract interest rates as low as 2.99% on the RGSM platform. The raising of funds on the RGSM is not a complete substitute for the use of the overdraft facility. 
However, funds obtained from the RGSM plus the overdraft facility should be used in tandem, resulting in an effective management of cash flows and a reduction in the short-term cost of interest. I seek Parliament's approval, ma'am. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow by means of advances sums not exceeding $55 million from commercial banks for a period of six months from the date hereof, which sum shall be charged on and paid out of the consolidated fund. Honourable Member for Labry. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to respond to the motion tabled, tabled by the Prime Minister to borrow $55 million by means of advances. Madam Speaker, what may seem as a very simple exercise on the surface we come here from time to time to perform this exercise. The opposition has expressed some serious concerns over time as to how we are managing the resources of this country and dealing with the business of the people. Madam Speaker, as I sat there listening to the Prime Minister, I took my journey through the corridors of time to my preschool days and think of the 43% of men, the comment made about the 43% of men. And my preschool curiosity has caused me to ask whether we are having a serious cash flow problem. Whether the time is not fast approaching when probably civil servants go to the bank and they cannot get paid. Our firemen, our nurses, and as usual, they laugh because we on this side have pledged very seriously, Madam Speaker, to subject the taxation of this government, its economic policy, to systematic scrutiny and now to new levels of critical examination. And I will resume normal navigation in this regard. <laughs> Madam Speaker, my preschool curiosity has prompted me to ask if we had not wasted monies on things like Ojo Labs and all the wastage in this country, whether there would be a need for us to come to the house to borrow in that particular fashion. <laughs> Madam Speaker, my preschool <coughs> curiosity has moved me to ask whether if the CIP program was managed in the way that it was intended, whether there would have been need for us to come and speak about borrowing in this way now. We are on the eve of a new budget cycle. And what was the pressing need to come here today? The Prime Minister make it look like it's a simple thing. My preschool curiosity has instructed me, Madam Speaker, to ask the question that if we had demonstrated great respect for the sacrifices that taxpayers in foreign countries that our traditional friends and non-traditional friends are making, whether there will be a need for us to borrow to that extent as a small, open, and vulnerable economy with high debt to GDP ratios, even though the rebase method has actually given a little soulagement, Madam Speaker. If we didn't jackhammer millions of dollars, if millions of dollars that were spent in the abattoir were not disregarded, the millions that were spent in, at the St. Jude's Hospital by our foreign government, would that have been a deterrent to some of them to graciously bless us with some more monies for our own development. RBTT is one of the banks, Madam Speaker, I see appearing there, and most of them are at the domestic level. I remember times that the former Prime Minister and member for Beaufort South used to come here and talk about borrowing from RBTT. And members opposite would have said he has some special relationship with Trinidad. Is the, prime, is the current Prime Minister in the same mode, having that very special relationship with Trinidad, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, where is the government that had committed to a private sector-led strategy 
of development? Where is that government? Where is that party? Madam Speaker, it is well documented, and I learned that at preschool. And I, I want to refer to a World Bank publication, A Time to Choose, Caribbean Development in the 21st Century. And it stated that to make a private sector-led development strategy work, government must deliver services effectively compared to the taxes and fees it charges and maintain a debt level that does not crowd out private investment and is consistent with macroeconomic stability. Let us dissect the anatomy of this statement into its constituent parts. One, to make a private sector-led development strategy work, government must deliver services effectively. That is the role of government, Madam Speaker. And this government is not delivering effectively on services. They have, they have failed to operationalize the, the new Owen King EU hospital. St. Jude's have been stopped abruptly. They stopped an administrative building in Viewport that would have improved service delivery in this country. This is, not, this is not the role of the private sector. It is the role of government. So, Madam Speaker, to make a private sector-led development strategy work, government must maintain a debt level that does not crowd out private investment and is consistent with macroeconomic stability. We are borrowing from Royal Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Royal Bank of Canada, First Caribbean International Bank, Bank of Nova Scotia, First National Bank of St. Lucia Limited, Bank of St. Lucia. The question is, in this environment that we're in, whether that would not crowd out private sector investment. And of course, my preschool knowledge and curiosity has actually moved me to ask those questions, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, under this government, there seem to be no significant levels of confidence in the economy. The private sector appears to be very cautious in its spending. Also, there has not been any significant government investment in this country. All the boasts, all the bluff and fluff in the last budget to do X, that, that DSA should have generated so many jobs and there will be so many jobs in, in, in the country. That has not come to pass. If you have failing private demand, rising saving ratio, and falling government spending, there will be an even more substantial fall in aggregate demand, making the economic recovery weak and very difficult. Whereas our local private sector has no confidence in this government. For example, if we continue our recklessness, for example, continue to allow ourselves to be blacklisted, we would be forced and disrespecting our international financial institutions like this government has been doing. The last time we were in the house, they attacked the World Bank. But if we continue to do that, we'll be forced into a situation where only at the domestic level we will get some space, and there are outer limits beyond which they will not go. So, Madam Speaker, given this context and given that most of our debt is domestic, borrowing from domestic banks could have a crowding out effect. And, Madam Speaker, again, the opposition will insist that we need to be very cautious about everything that we do. Borrowing in the context of economic sanity must be fundamental today. In the previous administration, we tried our best to reduce the deficit and to ensure that we pursue a course that will strengthen our domestic economy so that we'll deliver better services to the people of this country. And borrowing is one of the things that are very important in the context of everything. And so, Madam Speaker, I conclude by indicating that on the eve of a budget presentation, we are coming here to borrow. My preschool curiosity has caused me to ask the Prime Minister the aforementioned question. And so I'm hoping that he will respond and illuminate the issues further that will lead to deeper understanding. Because he was quite parsimonious in what he said about what he was going to utilize the facility to do. And so it leaves the door wide open to speculation, but I will not enter the realm of speculation. I will leave it to the Prime Minister to, of course, enlighten this Honorable House. I thank you, Madam Speaker.
Honorable Member for Castries South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to start by joining the Honorable Member from the Coast South, the Prime Minister, in wishing and solutions a happy independence anniversary, the 39th anniversary of our independence. And I'm certainly looking forward, Madam Speaker, to a number of activities in Castries South that will be commemorating our independence anniversary. I would have hoped, Madam Speaker, that the Prime Minister probably would have said some more about what's been organized around the island and what is available for various constituencies to be able to organize activities to commemorate independence because I have a number of groups in my constituency that are interested in organizing activities and face significant difficulty in getting assistance to do so. Only yesterday I called the Castries Constituencies Council to look for some banting and I was told that it is the Ministry of Social Transformation that deals with that. I called the Ministry and was told that there is no banting available. And a simple thing as banting to put up in communities, Madam Speaker, could make quite a difference for the look and feel of independence. And one would have hoped such simple things would have been available. But Madam Speaker, we will do the best we can in our various communities. The second point, Madam Speaker, I want to just raise, Madam Speaker, has to do with the presentation of statements, Madam Speaker, and to ask you whether or not, and I would wish that you would guide me, the full statement of what was said in the House is actually captured somewhere. So, for example, it may very well be for the answers that I have refused, reviewed, they've not really had statements because the Honorable Member for Castries South is actually said a lot more than what is contained in the statement. Now, it could be you ad lib as you present, and the totality of what is said needs to be captured because if we just take the simple statement that is circulated, I'm saying there is the impromptu ad lib that takes place, and I would trust that for full disclosure, the entire statement is in fact captured somewhere, Madam Speaker, and hopefully it will be enhanced. And you may wish, Madam Speaker, to just you know, provide information, because I am not sure. Now, Madam Speaker, um, if well, I can, I can answer immediately and tell you and inform you that the Hansard recording would be verbatim. So it would have, you can get a copy through the Hansard reports um, of the entirety of the Honorable Minister's statement. Okay? Please proceed. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I had not intended to, to say anything this morning, but while the Honorable Member for Library was speaking, I noted a lot of laughter and dismissal on the other side, Madam Speaker, almost as if the comments being made by the Member from Library were frivolous and has been described as preschool. Now, Madam Speaker, let's not take this preschool comment lightly when the Prime Minister of a country says that 43% of the male in the labor force have only had a preschool education. It is a serious indictment of our men in this country and of our labor force. And whereas the member from library said that he is part of that 43% of the labor force, Madam Speaker, it is a serious statement and we should not just laugh at those things. This is the business of the country. This is the leadership of the country. And when you say things, they have meaning and they, they convey messages about your country and about your people. But Madam Speaker, there was a lot of laughter. And I thought, Madam Speaker, I should say my little piece about the motion, Madam Speaker. Because Madam Speaker, it is made to look as if this is usual, this is what is expected, and this is nothing to talk about. Madam Speaker, is that really the case? It is provided, Madam Speaker, it is provided that government will operate overdraft facilities for managing short-term debt. It is provided. You don't have to use it. You don't have to use it. But you can use it if there is a need to use it. You follow me, Madam Speaker? Every six months, you are required to seek parliamentary approval to be able to operate the overdraft facility. 
you operate an overdraft facility if you don't have the revenue available. <coughs> Madam Speaker, anybody, business or household will tell you, you don't go and operate an overdraft facility where you incur interest if there's no need to do so. If you have the cash in your pocket, if you have the cash, otherwise, Madam Speaker, you don't have to go and use the overdraft facility. You use the overdraft facility because there's a necessity to use it. And the Prime Minister made mention of the regional um, mechanism that we have in place where short-term financing can be obtained. So in addition to if you have the revenue, you have that option. And when all else fails, Madam Speaker, which happens very often, we're not denying that, Madam Speaker, then you use the overdraft facility. But Madam Speaker, for me, I need to ask whether or not the $55 million has already been spent or committed, and therefore this is just the mechanism to be able to meet those payments, whether or not it has not been spent, and it will be spent over the next six weeks, because the financial year ends the end of March. Think about it. In six weeks, the financial year will end. Why is there a necessity, Madam Speaker, to borrow $55 million, Madam Speaker, for expenditure over the next six weeks? $55 million. Why is there such a necessity? So if it has not already been spent, it is for forecasted expenditure. And the Prime Minister mentioned, or he probably gave a hint of it, he said, we have salaries to pay. We have water bills to pay. I assume is that both is you and Admin Philippat. Because by the way, as I heard, school sports is now being cancelled because schools will not use the facilities because there's no water, Madam Speaker. A very sad state of affairs when you have three sports ministers, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, on a more relevant note, Madam Speaker, <laughs> what this tells us, Madam Speaker, is about the borrowing and lending policy of this government. And I say lending, Madam Speaker, because I want to explain it, Madam Speaker. This is a government that came into power saying that there will be no borrowing. That there will be no borrowing, Madam Speaker. They said so. They promised the people of St. Lucia and said over and over during the campaign that the Labour Party and the Kenny D'Antoni was borrowing too much money. And therefore, we will cease borrowing. Now, the Prime Minister has backtracked and he said, I did not say no borrowing. I said no borrowing unless there is a revenue stream. That's what he has come back and he's tried to mitigate the statement. But he did say no borrowing, that he would stop borrowing. Yeah. But we have not seen any stop in borrowing. In fact, Madam Speaker, in the estimates for this current financial year, we have one of the highest levels of borrowing in the history of this country from a government that said it was not going to have any more borrowing, Madam Speaker. So the motion today, Madam Speaker, puts to scrutiny. What is the policy of the government, Madam Speaker, as it relates to borrowing and to lending? I keep repeat, repeating lending, Madam Speaker, because it's two sides of one coin in the case of this government. Only in October, Madam Speaker, we came to this house and $50 million was borrowed from local banks. $50 million from local banks. We came to this house. Now an overdraft, Madam Speaker, of 55 million from local banks. Why is there, Madam Speaker, such a necessity to borrow from local banks? Is it because the government cannot raise the money through bonds or even treasury bills? Is that the case, Madam Speaker? Somebody needs to tell us. But also ask the question, why is there so much liquidity in the banking system? And why are local investors not using those monies for the development and other investment projects? Why is it that more persons are not taking loans to build houses? Why is there so much liquidity in the local banking system that the government can be raiding the local banks, Madam Speaker? Why? Is there a crisis of confidence, Madam Speaker? But this government told us, like the, leader, like the member for the library said, that this was going to be a private sector-led growth strategy. Investors will be bringing millions to St. Lucia, Madam Speaker. And there will be no borrowing in this country, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, I ask the question. 
where is all that investment that we were told would be coming? Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister, member for Miku South, said on a talk show program recently, he had gotten a loan of 150 million US from Taiwan for roads in St. Lucia. So people can continue to see all the roads that have been built in St. Lucia. A loan of 150 million US dollars is about 400 million dollars EC, Madam Speaker. If this country has taken a loan of 400, mil 400 million dollars, Madam Speaker, why has it not come to this house? Why has it not come to this house? Madam Speaker, what will be the impact of a loan of $400 million, Madam Speaker, on this country? And we are made to believe that this motion is just a matter of fact, and we should just accept it. This, in some ways, Madam Speaker, is an indictment of the fiscal management of this government, Madam Speaker. Because he made promises to the people of St. Lucia that there will be no borrowing. But six weeks before the end of the financial year, they are borrowing $55 million through advances. But Madam Speaker, that's not all. The Prime Minister also said he was also going to get a loan of $150 million for the airport. That's another $400 million, Madam Speaker. Between the airport and the roads program, that's $800 million, almost $1 billion that this country is borrowing this year. Well, you call it preschool mass. I know I went, only went to preschool, Madam Speaker, and I can add $400 million and $400 million, and I think it tells me it's $800 million. But if not come to this house, They've not come to this house to seek approval. Now, we were told, Madam Speaker, and we'll deal with this, not today, because we'll have enough time next month to deal with it, Madam Speaker, is 150 million US dollar loans for roads using the $1.50 fuel tax. But that's another story for another day. 150 million dollars US for the airport. That'd be, well, unless you kill me, honorable member, and God takes me away. I will see that day, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, you, you hear the kind of cryptic comments they're making, Madam Speaker? But let's continue, Madam Speaker. The Diga Road, Madam Speaker. The Diga Road, Madam Speaker. A road that had about $5 million for design. An existing road, you know, Madam Speaker. An existing road, Madam Speaker. All you have to do is resurface it and fix a few drains. Had about $5 million, I am told, Madam Speaker, for design. It came before this House, Madam, Madam Speaker, Speaker. On a point of order, I wish to advise the Honorable Member for um, Cassidy South that is incorrect in as far as the cost of the designs embedded in the contract. Madam Speaker, can the Honorable Member for Cassidy not indicate what is the figure? Honorable Minister, please proceed, Member for Catch Three South. <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Castries North, for clarifying it's not 5 million. It may be 4.5 million. But, Madam Speaker, Madam, <laughs> Madam Speaker, let's proceed because that's not the fundamental point. The point is, Madam Speaker, a document came before this House for debate on that loan for that road. And it was withdrawn by the Honorable Prime Minister. It has not returned to this House. It has not returned, Madam Speaker. And I noted in my recollection, tells me, Madam Speaker, that we were required to start repaying that loan in September last year. I'm sure, vaguely, Madam Speaker, I sat here and I read it. September last year. Is it that we've started repaying a loan for a road in Miku South? But the House has not even yet approved it, Madam Speaker. And we are made to believe to just approve $55 million because it's normal. It's not normal, Madam Speaker. It's not normal. It's available to you, and you can use it 
if it needs be, if needs be. But it is not normal, Madam Speaker. It's not required. Madam Speaker, you know what's most disturbing about all of this, Madam Speaker? When, Madam Speaker, I listened to the Prime Minister discuss the DSH project, Madam Speaker. DSH, Madam And again, Madam Speaker, and listen to me carefully about this, Madam Speaker, because we have the CIP in St. Lucia, which is supposed to earn revenue for this country. We have a donations option where money is supposed to go to a national economic fund, Madam Speaker, that Parliament is supposed to approve the use of those monies. And listen to what the Prime Minister says to us about DSH. He first announced it on Ray Quinn's program sometime last year that the developer will be upfronting the monies, Madam Speaker. He will build the racetrack and we will reimburse him through our CIP. So he will spend the, listen to this, the developer will spend the money, build the racetrack, and we'll reimburse him with our passport monies. Last week or week before, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister took this idea to levels that one not, would never believe was possible in this country. And listen to what the Prime Minister told us. And all of that is linked to borrowing, Madam Speaker, because we have resources in this country that can be used to repair schools, that can be used to repair health cent wellness centers, that can be used to deal with the issues facing our hospitals. And the Prime Minister says to us, Madam Speaker, and the people of must listen to this, that the developer will build a racetrack, we will reimburse him with our passport monies, he will then give it back to us. He will give it back to us. He will give it back to us because racetracks don't make money. So he's giving back to us something that does not make money. We will then engage him in a management contract, which means we pay him to manage it, for us. So there it is, he's building something. We pay him back for it, he gives it to us because it makes no money. And we will then engage him to manage it and operate it and pay him to do so. Now this is bewildering. Why would you take something from somebody which is not making money, pay him back with your passport monies that we can spend and avoid us coming to this house and borrow $55 million, but now we're going to pay him to manage it when it is not making money. But there's a further secret. The Prime Minister says there was a need to lease the land to the developer so he can use it as collateral. Think about that. So we leasing the land to the racetrack for him, for him to use as collateral to get a loan. So that developer is using our land as collateral to get a loan to build the racetrack. He's not repaying the loan. We're giving him the money. He repays the loan. He gives it to us because he's not making money. But why is he doing that? And why are we even accepting that? Hear what the Prime Minister says. The racetrack does not make money. It is the cheese that attracts all the money-making investments. It's the facilitator. So there you have a smart man who's a developer saying, this thing doesn't make money. I'm going to give it back to you all. And then pay me to manage it. But I need it. So I can attract, because that's the cheese, I can attract all the money-making investments. Now, all the money-making investments will be paid if our CIP money is too. But he's not giving it back to us. He's only giving back to us the one that does not make money. You follow me, Madam Speaker? The one that does not, not the Prime Minister Woods. These are his Prime Minister Woods. The Prime Minister said it is the cheese that will bring in other investment. The Prime Minister says it is a facilitator. The Prime Minister says the other elements will be paid using our traditional CIP investments. The Prime Minister says that. So the gentleman is going to build everything. The one that does not make money gives back to us, but he needs it. So we're going to pay him to manage it for us and use our CIP monies. It gets even more bizarre, Madam Speaker. The same gentleman says, I am only putting temporary facilities on the racetrack, and I'm going to start some races and bring down investors to see what I am doing and to try to entice them to invest. So he's not even putting permanent facilities, because he doesn't even have confidence that it will succeed. But he'll put temporary facilities with the hope of speculating. So you put temporary facilities, you have some huge races, and there may be races in St. Lucia next year for two, Madam Speaker. Multi-million dollar races paid for by our passport money. 
but he's only putting temporary facilities because if it fails, then nothing is lost. That is the policy that guides borrowing in this government, Madam Speaker. And you know last week, Madam Speaker, or week before, there's a place in London called the Excel Center. Huge exhibition hall. You know that I know that. I studied in London, Madam Speaker. I did a master's in England. I did a PhD in London. And I worked there for three years, Madam Speaker. You understand? So I know it well, Madam Speaker, just like I know other parts of the world well. And there are people in this house that cannot leave St. Lucia because they're under investigation, Madam Speaker. I'm not one of them. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, you know what happened at Excel two weeks ago? But Madam Speaker, by the way, the Prime Minister announced. Madam order, Speaker, was, order, yeah. please. Ma Madam Speaker, two weeks, a few months ago, two months or three months, the Prime Minister announced that he was going to take an investigation into allegations that a particular member of this house was under investigation. I would really want the Prime Minister at the next sitting to present the report of that investigation as to whether there is, in fact, an investigation into a particular member of this house. But back to Excel, Madam Speaker. At Excel, Madam Speaker, there was an international gaming conference taking place. International gaming. It's called ICE. You could Google it. ICE. It's online and offline gaming. And as it turns out, Madam Speaker, persons that I know, professionals, whatnot, messaged me and said to me, what's this thing going on? Because there are a group of investors selling this development in St. Lucia for gaming and horse racing. And he cannot believe that this is what St. Lucia has on the table. And I, I try to ask, well, who are those people? Because I don't know that anybody from St. Lucia went up to sell any gaming. But apparently, the speculation continues. And St. Lucia is a laughing stock. Because at this global conference on online and offline gaming, St. Lucia is being speculated for shares and investment in this big gaming enterprise that will be taking place in St. Lucia. And the people of St. Lucia knows nothing, know nothing about it, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, that's DSH for you. That's DSH for you, where we are lending money for our, of our CIP. Now, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister also announced at the signing of the range development, Madam Speaker, where a developer had signed the traditional CIP approach where he will go and find investors to invest in his hotel. And those investors would pay. And once they invest, they would get a citizenship. That had been abandoned. And the Prime Minister now says, and he announced the deal, that persons who can make a contribution through our donation, Madam Speaker, the donation money goes to the National Economic Fund to pay for health care, for education, repair of schools, repair of playing fields. He's now taking that money, not for the people of St. Lucia, and he's giving it to a loan to the developer, 2% per, per, per annum. The Prime Minister said it. He said it. So we're going to take almost 450 million EC dollars of monies we will get from the sale of our passports, and we're giving it to a developer to build a hotel that the developer will own. And the developer repays that 2% interest, Madam Speaker. So we're borrowing money at 6%, 7%, but we're giving a developer, Madam Speaker, a loan from our National Economic Fund. And the Prime Minister, we've, been, we've told Madam Speaker over and over that this is illegal. The laws does not allow for that. The same press conference, the Prime Minister said at the next sitting of this House, he's coming with a document to correct this. Of course, this is the next sitting, and it has not been presented to this House, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, we have range. We have DSA. GSA, Madam Speaker, is the most bewildering and illogical investment. For a prime minister who said it was idiotic to subsidize rice, flour, and sugar for poor people in this country because other people were benefiting, to now take our monies, give it to a developer, to build a racetrack, which he gives back to us because he's not making money. We pay him to manage it, and he uses that to get all the other investments that make money, that will be built with our CIP money. And you tell me, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm only a, of a preschool education. I'm one of the 43 percent. Madam Speaker, you see this boring motion? Yes, Madam Speaker, many times in the past, other prime ministers and ministers of finance have come to this house to get approval for overdraft facilities, Madam Speaker. But I am disturbed, Madam Speaker, when this thing is treated so frivolously, six weeks before the end of the financial year, from a government that told us that the economy is doing well the member for ancillary economies, Madam Speaker, and we will respond to him appropriately at the right time, Madam Speaker, to boast of how things are so bright and prosperous in this country, Madam Speaker. Bright and prosperous. And then to come to the House to borrow another $55 million. 
It's not as simple as that, Madam Speaker. It's not as simple as that. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister for Housing, <coughs> Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Aviation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Madam Speaker, you would think that a bill as simple as this, laid before the House, which is routine, every single government from independence to now, Madam Speaker, has had to go through that process. I went through it when we were in opposition. We are going through it when we are in government. <clears throat> You'd have the members opposite, and you would think that it is something so extraordinary that is happening in the parliament, Madam Speaker. And we heard them all over the place about all kinds of things. Now, Madam Speaker, how do you reasonably sit in this honorable house and not respond to some of the statements that are being made? I mean, the member for Labry, the member for Labry got a try as leader of the opposition, and he is behaving <laughs> like a preschool, like a preschool. <laughs> And he's, given, and he's given a preschool speech to the Honorable House today, Madam Speaker, and saying all the things he learned at preschool. But some of the things he should have learned at preschool is what is routine. You, 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 it just happens. Madam Speaker, we are not here just borrowing $55 million to go and draw down. This is a security measure that all governments use. Every single government. And they know how many times they did it when they were there. Well, I heard the member for Castro South. He's a newcomer. He doesn't know. So I excuse him. He doesn't know the routine of what happens. But Madam Speaker, to make it look like we're crowding out investors and local um, developers by using the facilities, an overdraft facility at the bank that is going to crowd out private investment. That's what the member for Labry said. Now, I take it, Madam Speaker, <laughs> one of these days we'll get to instant replay. <laughs> we'll get to instant replay. <laughs> you know, talking about this is a government that said that development should be led by private sector and that by borrowing, we may be crowding out the opportunity for private investors to get the cash because the government is taking the cash. But the member for Castro South is on a completely different page because he is talking about there's so much liquid. The, the, the system is so liquid that is that why the government is using so i don't know what they're talking about the two of them um but madam speaker you had them raising issues about the borrowing of 55 million dollars and mentioning the banks and if the member for library want to know the relationship that existed between trinidad when we were referred to as Trinidad, Tobago, and St. Lucia, or St. Lucia, Trinidad, and Tobago. He can ask the member for Viewfort South. He can enlighten him on that and what transpired during that time. But, Madam Speaker, some of the issues raised. Let me respond to the IFC statement that members continue to highlight. Madam Speaker, in this honorable house, when we stand up and we speak, we can speak politics and we can speak to the issues. But the signals that we send out there and the messages that are sent to entities that we deal with as a government, we must be careful. No. 
You cannot see a record where I said the IFC is corrupt. I was making a clear statement of trust that as much as you can trust the IFC is as much as you can trust the people of St. Lucia. And I was making a comparison, Madam Speaker. I was making a comparison of statements and the issues that I had with the proposals of the IFC are legitimate issues. Questions are being asked because the opposition was presenting that because it is the IFC and they give you something, you are not supposed to question it. That was, that was the essence of the discussion. But what has happened, Madam Speaker? They have taken it and they have turned it around. And I can stand by the statements that was made. The statement I said, I'm not going to call anybody corrupt. And I stopped short of mentioning any names of the people that we dealt with. Because I understand, Madam Speaker, you are dealing with international institutions. Institutions that the government engages. But to give the expression or to give the impression that because it is from the IFC, we can trust it. And if it comes from the government and people of St. Lucia, it cannot be trusted. It's unacceptable to me as a St. Lucian and as a member of this honorable house. So, Madam Speaker, they can continue to grapple with it. I made a simple statement this morning, Madam Speaker. I made a simple statement this morning about, you think you'll see that time? And then, you hear what they jump on? They jump on, oh, will you kill me? Madam Speaker, wh where does that come in? You said the time will come, so I cannot ask if you'll be there to see this time come. I may not be there to see the time come. So, Madam Speaker, trying to handle a situation that does not exist. So the airport, the airport matter was a matter of ownership. And the issue we had with the IFC, and we still have, is the proposal of who would have ownership of the airport. I come into, I come into DSH, don't worry. We'll have time to talk about DSH. Madam Speaker, when the member for Labry speaks about there's lack of confidence in St. Lucia and where the jobs that we spoke about, Madam Speaker, I have to wonder what the member for Labry is talking about. When the member for Labry left government, unemployment was hovering near 25%. In the last quarter of, the, of this financial year, um, of the year 2017, unemployment was down to 16%. 16.8%. Madam Speaker, these are not numbers put out by the government. Oh, the bad numbers now. So, 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 Madam Speaker, apparently you're not representing Labry. That's why you don't know what's happening in Labry. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is a this this opposition accused us of firing thousands of people, and I want you to understand the mathematics that you use. You said we fired thousands of people. Yet still the records are showing that more people are employed under the United Workers Party government than was employed under the Labour Party administration. So, explain that to me. You explain to me. You explain to me. That is, you see, Madam Speaker, 
That is what confidence does. The people, the people of St. Lucia have confidence in the United Workers Party government administration. So more jobs are being created across the board. That's right. That's right. Madam That's Speaker, they want to talk about management. You finished it. Eh? Your report, your report said, the report made by the member for Viewport South and Prime Minister at the time was that by August 2016, the people of Beaufort would have a state-of-the-art hospital. Work continued until the end of the year 2016 in Beaufort. So the state-of-the-art hospital that you gave the people of Beaufort, it is there. <laughs> the state-of-the-art hospital that was supposed to cost $60 million by his own words, and now in the region of 118 million, it is there. So if that is what the free MPs for the Viewfort area, Viewfort North, Viewfort South, and Labry, if that is what you all consider a state-of-the-art hospital for the people of Viewfort, I say under the United Workers Party government, the people of Viewfort deserve much better than that. If that's all you think, If that's all you could offer them, we had better stop it and give them something better. The people of Beaufort will get a better hospital under the UWP administration than they could dream of under the Labour administration. So, take your time. Take your time. You had five years to build a hospital. Five years. You march on the gates of St. Jude. You said, give the sportsmen the stadium. And after five years, and if I spend five years, if I spend five years in government, and I cannot give the people of Beaufort a better hospital than what you gave them as a state-of-the-art hospital, then I don't deserve to be in this honorable house. That's what you heard. That's what you heard. You don't know anything that was happening in here. So, Madam Speaker, the members opposite are talking about, you know, you, you borrowed $55 million and you borrowed $150 million for roads. The evidence is there that the roads in St. Lucia are on the path to total improvement. We have better roads driving on now than we had under the Labour Party administration. Right. And you the facts can speak for itself. It does not need you because we know that members opposite do not understand the facts. What they understand is what they see from their political standpoint. So, Madam Speaker, coming to this honorable house and saying that the member for Labry, I suspect he's sitting in the chair of the leader of the opposition. I assume that he's deputizing. I suspect he's deputizing, and that caused him to misbehave this morning, Madam Speaker. <laughs> and give something that is uncharacteristic of him. That, that's unlike the member for Labry. That he would speak preschool stuff in the Honorable House today. So, Madam Speaker, he said, he said there's lack of confidence. And I cannot believe that even the chamber, the chamber, if you look at the chamber's report, it is reporting that there is confidence. It is not as much as they want it to be, but the evidence is there. Madam Speaker, they want to question our management of the economy. Now, let me give you a lesson. Okay? When we said we were reducing VAT by 
Y'all said we were mad. We were taking more. We were shortchanging the government $54 million. Well, what you don't understand is that reduction in VAT, coupled with all of the other things that this government is doing, has resulted in the reduction of unemployment in this country. Of course they will. The people of St. Lucia have responded. <laughs> Not they will respond. They have responded. Because, Madam Speaker, but it is clear, Madam Speaker. You should tell me. You are the parliamentary representative. You said library is a republic. I do not have access to the information in library because it's the Republic of Library. So I expect the President of the Republic to give the information in the House. Don't ask me for the People's Republic. Yes. So, so Madam Speaker, I am, I am confident, Madam Speaker, that this country is on the right path to growth and development. I am confident that we are on the right path. And the evidence is there, Madam Speaker. If you are saying that government has not undertaken any major capital projects, can you imagine? So who's driving the growth that we are seeing? And when the growth figures... But that's what I'm saying to you. <laughs> the government has not even begun spending the 150 million US on the roads. We have not started the airport project. And imagine the economy is performing better already than it did under the St. Lucia Labor Party. So can you imagine? Can you imagine when the Ministry of Infrastructure and they circulated a booklet there, you saw it? Works. <laughs> Works. Because what did we promise the people of St. Lucia? We are going to build a new St. Lucia. That is what we promised. And that is what we are delivering on. Now I know, Madam Speaker, I've been in opposition and I've been in government. I know it is not easy for the opposition to sit there and see the country doing well. Madam Speaker, I heard the member, I heard the member for, I heard the member for Castro South talk about resources. Castro South, yes. I heard the member talk about the resources. Now here's what he said, Madam Speaker. The resources of this country could have been used to fix schools, to open the hospital, to do all of these things. And I agree with you. Now you know why I agree with you? Because I know under the UWP administration, the resources will be there. But you all spent five years in government. There were no resources to fix the schools. There were no resources to open the hospital. So I feel good when I see you have more confidence in this UWP administration to find resources to do the things in the country than you have on the same side that you sit in. No. Why, you, why are you so in a hurry? <laughs> we know your time is limited, but at the same time, you don't take it easy. Take it easy. It doesn't matter where it's limited. It's limited. Okay? So, Madam Speaker, the motion led by the Prime Minister must not be allowed to be viewed from the standpoint that the opposition wants to make it look like 
we are careless, reckless government just come in and borrow left, right, and center. That's not what it is. And if you want, it is not how much you borrow. It is what you do with the money that is borrowed. That's right. That's the point. Okay? That's the point. That's the point. So, so when you talk about things, so why you didn't say we had to borrow that money to pay the $6 million on the project in River Dory that you all could have paid $3 million and resolve that matter and save the government the embarrassment of going to court and losing a case. And when you talk about political victimization, why wasn't the gentleman paid for his contract? Why did we have to go to court, pay lawyers? And I have, I have a stack of letters here, Madam Speaker. All of these. Lawyers, receipts. They have too many of them. How many thousands of dollars was paid to lawyers? If you owe pay, you know the work was done. Pay the gentleman. But you will choose the things you want to highlight that the government must pay. We should have spent 60 million on St. Jude. We spent 118 million. Did you choose to highlight that in your presentation? Did you choose to highlight maybe this 55 million? And when you talk about confidence, why we come in six weeks before? It will be proven in time. You, you want to know? You should tell me. You are the parliamentary rep for library. The constituency is the... the Hospital is on the border of your constituency. You are in government. You are asking me how much money you spend in St. Jude? I, say, I said the figures. You have to come and tell me I was in government. That money was not spent. But tell me you are clueless. You didn't know anything that was. Madam Speaker, through you. The member for library did not know what was happening at St. Jude. So if you are so concerned about the people of Viewfort and what hospital they have, why didn't you see to it that the money spent in library was well spent? That it could have brought about what was needed. My final point, Madam Speaker. DSH. I heard the member for Castries South talk about DSH. So, do you know what you want? Through you, Madam Speaker. They said we should not give the land to a foreigner. Mm -hmm. That has been a big outcry. So now we say St. Lucia is going to own the horse racing track. You still have a problem. So what do you want? Boss Eju is making money? I ask you a question, Madam Speaker, through you, and I've given him the opportunity to answer. <laughs> Sorry. Boss, you making money? <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> not every facility built by a government, is going to bring you back net profit. You don't know that? Boss says you close up the, you, you don't know it wasn't making profit. I did, Madam Speaker, we built a cricket stadium. We built a cricket stadium. We are cricket lovers in this country. We have the West Indies team. But the cost, the cost of maintenance of this facility in and of itself, and the one or two matches you can host when you're lucky in a year, and with these days West Indies performing so poorly, you, it, it, exactly, it's costing you more to host the game than you're making. But would I ever say a cricket stadium is not good for St. Lucia? I would not say that, Madam Speaker. 
But if you go in purely on the economics of it, then you have to ask yourself, is this the best investment? Yes, sir. Very good point. Okay? So when the member for Castries South would come and give the impression, oh, because the horse racing track not making money, you should not. So you don't understand the economics of what happens around Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is evident that the members opposite, they say a drowning man will catch on to a straw. They have nothing to say in the Honorable House today. They should have just let the bill go through. But Madam Speaker, they invent all kinds of arguments to say that we should not be borrowing by overdraft. You know what's an overdraft? You know what's an overdraft? An overdraft is there that you have access to. You are not required to use it. If your cash flow is good enough, and we can't pretend, don't come and pretend that cash flow of government is so good. You issue projects, sometimes the monies are not released yet. The donor agencies, the salaries and everything, the time of collection, don't try and give the people of St. Lucia the impression that you know every time government needs money, money is sitting there. All of, all of the sinking fund accounts was closed under the Labor Party. And I can tell you, when the Labor Party came into office in 1997, there were nine sinking, there were nine projects under sinking fund. By 2001, they didn't have one. That is what happened under the watch of the Labour Party. So we have not built reserves. We know that. We do not have the reserves. So when you do not have the reserve for your cash flow, you need an overdraft. And you need some more businessmen over there. Because if you had businessmen over there, you would understand what the value of an overdraft is to cash flow for the running of a business. And that is all. But you need to learn how to run a business to run, because that's why every time y'all need that money, y'all just go and borrow. No, no means to pay. My prime minister, the leader on this side said, the borrowing is going to be, every bor set of borrowing will have its own revenue stream. And the 400 million you talk about for the roads, we have created a clear revenue stream for that. The dollar 50 on the gas. We didn't hide that. We came to the people of St. Lucia. We came to the parliament and we said, this is what is going to happen. And even, even now, part of the money that is spent on the roads was from that same gas tax. It's evident. So, you talk about the airport. And another four. You talk about 400 million for the airport. Well, let me tell you the numbers you're not giving. In the proposal by the IFC, Apart from the cost of the airport, there was an additional 160 million US added to the 200 million cost of the airport. For yes. I know. Let me tell you. I have stood the test of every investigation. I hope you can do the same. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, investigations, they spoke about members of the House being investigated. Investigations are a good thing because investigations reveal two things, innocent or guilty. Okay? That is what the investigation is going to show. Who is innocent and who is guilty? Now, standing on this side, I can say, after five years of investigation, 
I believe I'm innocent. <laughs> Okay? No, I always know I am innocent. But for their benefit, who did not know and did not believe, I believe now they know I'm innocent. So I am hoping that as investigations continue, that they can stand the same test that I have stood. That be innocent. Okay? So, Madam Speaker, it is easy to take cheap shots at people in the parliament. And I'm used to that. I'm used to being a target. But at the same time, it cannot be that we are going to come to this house. They should have told us that they paid $3 million. Don't you think that affected the cash flow? The $3 million that was paid to investigate me? If you all had given me that three million dollars, I would have been better off. Because I could give you all the information for free. <laughs> you know? You hire the most expensive fraud investigator you could find in the US to investigate me. Three million dollars. Okay? And then why you are the, the report should be tabled in Parliament. You want the PM to table report on CIP. Where's the report on my investigation? Taxpayers' money. Three million dollars. Table it in the Parliament. I'm not afraid of what's in it. Table what you found in the Parliament. The report that the three million dollars was paid for. That is the report I want tabled in the parliament. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is evident. It is evident, Madam Speaker. You think I'm afraid of any document? Madam Speaker. There's, there's no document. I always walk around with the most documents. You think I'm afraid of documents? I hope you can submit your documents. Because, Madam Speaker, it is one thing to point fingers at other people and talk about who's investigating and who's being investigated. I don't have to worry about what they'll find out about me. I already know what they will find out. And that's why I can speak loud anywhere I am. Because I know what's there. But Madam Speaker, so when the Labor Party administration would spend $3 million of taxpayers' money to investigate one member of parliament, and then not even, and nobody knew, nobody knew, at the Treasury, Madam Speaker, one page. The last page of the contract with the signature because this is too classified to be there. Now, you know what that reminds me of, Madam Speaker? When information is too classified, it doesn't find itself in government because the same people who tell you everything, oh, trust. And when I, Madam Speaker, I remember sometime I spoke about trust. When people cannot trust themselves, they will not trust you. They couldn't trust themselves to handle the airport project. They couldn't trust themselves to give the accountant general the contract for the investigation. So they gave the last page with the signature. So I don't know who was holding the other pages. But I know under Rochamel that they could not trust the government that they were part of to hold the document. So they gave it to one by the name of Humphrey. Because he was more trustworthy than the government on Greenberg. So, Madam Speaker, when I come to this honorable house, and when the members opposite want to debate on issues that do not exist, you're making a big fuss about $55 million overdraft facility 
to run the operations of the government. I'm talking about whether there's money to run the affairs, to pay public servants. And you want to scare people by saying, maybe when teachers go to the bank, their salaries will not be there. When you came into government, you found over $210 million in reserve. By the third year in government, they have nothing left. And you want to talk about management of this economy? You want to talk about who can manage better? <coughs> That's not a discussion. That's not a debate. You're not in the equation. You're not even on the starting line to say you can finish the race. You're not on the starting line. You didn't qualify. <laughs> You're not part of the finalists. So understand that. And understand that the people of St. Lucia have elected the United Workers Party government under the leadership of the member for Mikud South to run the affairs of state for five years. And the people of St. Lucia will judge the performance of this government in, in five years. And when they judge, I can tell you, we will continue to be here, and some of you will not even be over there, far less for him. I thank you, Madam <laughs> Speaker. Honorable Member for Denry North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I commence yet another presentation in this Honorable House, I want to take the opportunity to once again thank the people of Denry North. This time on the eve of Ash Wednesday and on the eve of the commencement of the holy season. Madam Speaker, having sat in my chair this morning listening to the debate, it reminded me of the words of a former New York governor who said that politicians, a lot of them, they campaign in poetry and they govern in prose. And the simple understanding of that, Madam Speaker, is that when some politicians are on the campaign trail, they say one thing. And after having won the election and find themselves in government, the storyline changes, and it is a totally different conversation. Now, Madam Speaker, as I understand the motion before us, it is supposed to be procedural. It is supposed to be something that should have gone through the House this morning in perhaps half an hour, 40 minutes, and then the business of the day would have been done and would have been completed. But what is most astonishing, Madam Speaker, is the extent to which people can forget the things they said when they were on the opposite side of the parliamentary aisle. And for us to be an effective parliament, Madam Speaker, I believe every single one of us must find it in our resolve to embrace objectivity as we attend to the business of this country. Madam Speaker, all the speakers before me, or presenters before me, took the latitude to wish St. Lucians a happy independence celebration, 35th anniversary that is. 39th, sorry, Madam Speaker. Maybe the preschool math is getting to me. <laughs> but Madam Speaker, before I proceed further into the substantive matter before us, with your indulgence, if you allow me, I want to make two very brief points which I, which I consider very important and should be mentioned in this parliament. Firstly, Madam Speaker, I want to implore all the teachers and students and housemasters who are organizing sports meets for the different schools and the different students in our country. As a former minister responsible for youth development and sports, I need to say that this was a period in the year that I always look forward to. And there was nothing that spurred me on as minister more than seeing children exciting themselves and enjoying themselves in physical activity. Because I believe, Madam Speaker, by organizing those activities, we are sending a very important message to our young people 
that the need to engage in physical activity as an expensive way of combating some of the chronic non-communicable diseases we have in this country. Madam Speaker, secondly, and lastly, before I return to the motion before us, I want to express my sincere condolences to the families of all the young people who have perished amidst the carnage on our roads in recent times. Madam Speaker, most recently, we lost a young cricketer by the name of Nick Eli Box from Mark in Castries, Southeast. He is a young man, Madam Speaker, whom I knew very well. I worked with him and I followed his career very, very closely. And it was very heart wrenching on the morning, that Sunday morning, when news broke that Nick had met his demise in a vehicular accident. His loss, Madam Speaker, is one that is suffered by the entire sports fraternity, in particular the cricket family, the Windward Islands um, cricket setup. And I'm sure, Madam Speaker, had he not been cut short by this unfortunate incident, he would have been one of the many young cricketers I'm hoping would have gone on to represent the West Indies in the coming years. So, Madam Speaker, my prayers and thoughts are with the families of the young persons whom, we, with whom we've lost, in particular, the family of Nick Eli Box. Madam Speaker, the motion before us this morning is no less morbid and depressing. And the posture we've assumed here as an opposition is one that we are duty bound to assume on behalf of the people whose interests we represent in this parliament. I am not one who believes that an opposition should oppose only for the sake of opposing. We have to be more objective than that. And today, Madam Speaker, we have a legitimate reason to question what is before us. Madam Speaker, I remember sitting on the other side of the House between 2011 and 2016. And this very motion, the only thing that is different to what is before us today are some of the figures and the date at which the motion is being presented. And you should have heard some of the members opposite, one in particular. We were excoriated, we were chided, we were criticized for borrowing. And we were constantly reminded that we were exacerbating an already bad debt situation for the country. But today, the shoe is on the other foot and justification is being provided. Sometimes the quality of the debate is not reflected in the amount of noise you make in here, you know. But the words that you speak, the spoken words, the things we say. Today, Madam Speaker, there are a number of St. Lucians who supported the United Workers' Party in the elections of 2016. And for them, a lot of expectations have been violated. We've known for a while now that the cash flow situation in the country was not what any one of us would have wanted for our country. But I made the point before, in this honorable house and on platform, when as a responsible government, we took a position and we told St. Lucians what the situation was with our finances in this country, it was convenient for the then opposition party to present a picture that everything would have been okay once you had voted for the United Workers' Party. There would have been ching ching in the pocket. There would be no unemployment in St. Lucia. Everybody would be at work and things would have been cook and curry, as we say, Madam Speaker, for all St. Lucians. But today, Madam Speaker, today, Madam Speaker, and this is a question that is very genuine. We've been told, and St. Lucia is a very small society, and we always know what is happening within the corridors of government, within the confines of the parliament, and even in the private se sector. Madam Speaker, we've been told, and reliably so, that the date for the annual budget, or the national budget, has been advanced, and that we will be having budget for the first time in a long time, if not for the first time, in the month of March. March, Madam Speaker, is a mere week and a half away. What is the urgency? What is the urgency that must cause the government to come into the parliament a mere week and a half, two weeks, before the presentation of the annual budget to borrow $55 million? It is a question, Madam Speaker, that I believe is worth explaining so as to understand not just my understanding as the member for Denry North, 
but all the other persons who are following this debate um, as it, it, it goes on. Madam Speaker, I cannot recall, as I said, this having happened prior to today. So as my colleagues on this side have said, Madam Speaker, the debt situation that confronts our country today is one that needs urgent attention. And we cannot continue to borrow in the manner that we've been borrowing. Every government, not just in St. Lucia, but the entire OECS must borrow because we do not have the capacity to raise revenue whereby, Madam Speaker, whatever we have to spend would be equal to, to the amount that we are able to raise. So borrowing is a must. Borrowing is a must. But we have, Madam Speaker, to borrow for things that will impact the lives of our people. The Prime Minister has said before, and the point was further accentuated by the member for Castries Southeast, whereby the Prime Minister said that for every new loan or debt situation he's going to embrace, there will be a revenue stream to address that. Madam Speaker, if this is going to happen, I will be one of the first persons to lend support to it. Because I understand, objectively, that a worsening debt situation for this country is not a problem only for the United Workers Party. But it's a problem for us on the opposition side, and it's a problem for all of St. Lucia. But how does that borrowing impact the lives of the people in the community? Am I to assume, Madam Speaker, that this $55 million will cause the Ministry of Health to reinstate the Larissus Health Center that has been out of commission for two years? Am I to assume, Madam Speaker, if this level of borrowing that the lapel road in my constituency will be resurfaced? And am I to assume, Madam Speaker, that with this level of borrowing, some of the schools in this country wouldn't have to postpone or cancel their sports meets because some of the playing facilities are out of commission? If the money being borrowed, Madam Speaker, is to impact some of the people I've mentioned in a positive way, I have absolutely no difficulty with it. But there are a couple issues here at play. You say one thing on the campaign trail, and when reality hits you in the seat of government, not only do you change your storyline, but in some cases you can't even muster the courage. You can't even muster the courage to come and tell people the situation as it is. So, Madam Speaker, some of the questions I've asked today are genuine questions that the people of Denry North would like answered. With this, Madam Speaker, I conclude my contribution to the debate on this motion. Honorable Member for Beaufort North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to join, Madam Speaker, my colleagues. Um, I wish to join my colleagues, Madam Speaker, in, in wishing the constituents of Beaufort North well on the observance of the soon to be observed anniversary of St. Lucia's independence. And I also wish to indicate to them, Madam Speaker, as we begin a new, a, a new calendar year, that I will continue to do my best to represent them in the parliament, Madam Speaker, to ensure that they, get, they continue to get their roads fixed and, and, and other amenities. Madam Speaker, I wish, since this debate entered so many different road, so to speak. I wish, Madam Speaker, to, to join this debate at the point where the member for Castries Southeast admitted for the first time from, from the government side, Madam Speaker, that governments do, must not operate as businesses. He admitted, Madam Speaker, in his explanation that there are projects that governments must keep even though they are making a net loss. And that was astounding, Madam Speaker, because this is the same government that continues to say, if a project is not making money, close it. So they closed Radio St. Lucia, and again the argument is that Radio St. Lucia is not making money. It's a loss-making entity, so close it. They're about to 
close the print tree as it stands, as it is, Madam Speaker. The marketing board is a loss-making entity, so close it. The Fish Marketing Corporation is a loss-making entity. So do something about it. Close it. The Foisson Center, a loss-making facility. So close it. And they often speak of Boseju, Madam Speaker. And the member for Kasri South is, has a fetish, has some fetish with Boseju and, and myself. He indicated a while ago that Boseju was closed, closed under my watch. I wish to indi indicate categorically, Madam Speaker, that this is not true. Again, false information. And the member for Kasri South is. And he continues to make the point that cows disappeared while I was Minister for Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I wish to take this very seriously because he's suggesting that under my watch as Minister for Agriculture, there were cows at Boseju, and for some reason, cows disappeared while I was Minister for Agriculture. This is not true. Let me vini Minister Agricole, Madam Speaker, la pateni Boseju pateni bef. C'est bef la qui te pak Boseju a, c'est bef Jean Privé. Okay? La 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 ni misé kon gage ek a chai fama ki te ni bef a pak e pot la. Boseju had no cows. The time that the dairy farm was closed at Boseju, Madam Speaker, I was a student in school. I was a student. So for the member for Castle South is to continue to say this. And I have asked the Minister for Agriculture to instruct him that he should stop saying those things in the House because people will assume that as Minister for Agriculture, there were cows at Boseju and they disappeared when I became Minister. This is not true and I want it to be reflected in the records that when I became Minister of Agriculture, there were, Boseju owned no cattle. And that is a fact. And so even though you take it as a joke, these are things that go down in the record, and I want to ensure that it's corrected. Madam Speaker, so all the things that are managed by St. Lucians, that are developed and grown by St. Lucians, must be closed. Because they are loss-making entities. So Radio St. Lucian, no need to fermé. Bagay set lycien. Marketing board, no need to fermé. Because he pa ka fait l'argent. That is what this government has been about. The fisheries complex. No need to fermé. You know one thing that is common in all of those things, Madam Speaker? is because they are managed by St. Lucians. They have St. Lucian roots. Of course, they have problems, like many things in our country. And there are many businesses, private businesses, that have problems. And the government props them up. Of course, there are businesses that have problems. But all of those entities are solution entities. But the member for Castle South is now says today that DSH, the racetrack, even though it's a loss-making entity, he said, Net profit, even though it's a loss-making entity, there are times when government must keep those. You know the difference between DSH and all of those St. Lucian entities? DSH is controlled by a foreigner. By a foreigner. And that's the big difference. So he admits today that there are times when government need entities, even though they are loss-making, even though they do not record a net profit. But all of the St. Lucian ones must go. But DSH is good, even though the racetrack may be a loss-making entity. The, he admits that today. And I have said very often, Madam Speaker, that it is for St. Lucians to look at the facts and decide. Because members opposite, especially the member for Castle Southeast and the Prime Minister, they tell you the things 
bold face. And I give that to them. They tell you the things openly and bold face. And I believe that is why the Prime Minister says, said that 43% of the men in the workforce didn't, didn't pass preschool. He is openly and bold face telling St. Lucians that that is who you are, you men out there. That's who you are. You didn't, you didn't go to primary school. And openly so, he tells you that. You didn't go to primary school. The inference there, Madam Speaker, is so I can do what I want. I can deal with you. Because you all didn't go to primary school. You all only went to preschool. And these are the kinds of attacks, Madam Speaker, that we have on our St. Lucian nest. And this time, the member for Caspi's office explains it elucidly that the racetrack is not making profit. We will keep it. Because there are times you need entities that don't make profit. But the others, let's go with them. And so it does not matter if Mr. T.O. Akin gets Sandy Beach. I guess Sandy Beach does not make profit. Ale bola me Sandy Beach. La pani po fiansa. Kosa usa baya amuni. Maria Island la pani po fiansa. And oh how he likes to giggle when you talk about those things. Because to him, Madam Speaker, those things don't matter. Those St. Lucian things don't matter to them. The Bacada area, the Il Pirata area, those things don't make profit. So let's give it to a foreigner. The, Bo the whole Bosejou area, the whole 350 acres. The Prime Minister has said it himself. That, that's just a wasteland. I'm making no profit. So just give it to T.O.R. King. The meat processing facility, they say is $11 million. And again, an untruth. They like to do that. The $21 million meat processing facility. That's not important. Let's get rid of it. Because we have a big master called T.O. King who needs that. That is the attitude of the government, Madam Speaker. It is only the things, the things that are St. Lucian, these are the things that we give away. Oh, you all like to talk about Rochamel. There's only one prime minister in this country that a court has ever said that they can't trust what he says. And he's sitting on the other side. In the tuxedo villas matter, you all like to talk about Let's talk about real things with facts. Let's talk about Tuxedo Villas. You all like to talk about Rochamel. You all went in a cabinet and say a man's home is a hotel. You all forget that? Oublie ça? Ek lo dies la di. Mouna ki te mini storyzm la. Yo pas a kwe sa ika di. Yo pas a kwe sa ika di. We ain't forgetting that. So, Madam Speaker, the member for Caspi South is admitted today that, yes, there are things that the government must keep, even though they are loss-making entities. But all of the St. Lucian things, they are not making money, so we need to get rid of them. Also, Madam Speaker, there's a whole discussion about borrowing and the, and the relationship to VAT. And the member said opposite that they reduced VAT by 2.5% and so on and so on. Madam Speaker, while they do one thing on one hand, on the other hand, the Prime Minister and his Minister in the Ministry for Finance, they sit weekly and figure out how to take more from the, the other hand. So while they reduce VAT by 2.5%, it 
each person with a small car, a sedan, pays over $6,000 in gas taxes a year. The fishers, a fisherman who goes out to see a fisherwoman, who goes out to sea four times a week, using three 15-gallon tanks, Sayokaku Ekins, they will pay $13,000 extra in gas taxes, the fishers. And we've calculated, calculated it over and over with them. So while you talk about removing 2.5%, you have placed the burden on the small family, the professionals, the teachers, those people who work in the banks, the children of the farmers and the fishers who can purchase a little car to take the family to hospital and to school. That's where you have placed the burden. And you calculate it. I want you to calculate it. Check the number of gallons of fuel you use a day, multiply it by $1.50, and multiply that by the fuel you use per week, per month, per year, multiply it by 12, and you'll see how much money that you have taken from the pockets of the people in gas taxes. So when you talk about 2.5% VAT, it's a flashing mirror. And I want you to go to the, to the supermarkets and ask Mr. Jaim from Grace and Mrs. Aldonza from Bellevue how much more they are paying in groceries after you took out the 2.5% VAT. And it's, it's the effect on the individual in the household. So I parle by CP share, Dio, outil 2.5% VAT. Et comment on va prendre la main en l'argent, gas là, on va mettre pour y pêcher. And you can do the calculations, I've said 13,000, and, and this fisherman that I've used, I gave him three months holiday in the year. I only used 40 weeks. I didn't use all of the weeks in the year. Go and calculate it. Go to your communities. Go to Miku and Ancillary and those places where you have fishers and find out how much you're taking in taxes from them on fuel. Go and do the calculations. I've done it many times with them and they themselves are shocked. They are shocked themselves. They say, Moussa, I'm going to say, Moussa, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, and if you do that for three years, 13 multiplied by three, you see how much money you have taken from the, from, from the people who are supposed to drive the economy at the base. I don't know anything about money. And this fuel, Madam Speaker, since we are talking about borrowing and taxes, you know something? This extra road tax that you have placed is on top of the license fees and all of that you said you reduced. You did not remove it completely, you know. After all, if you put in a road tax, that's so much money. Give them a breakdown that you only remove half of the, half of the increase. When you add that to the $13,000, you see how much money you're extracting from those people. So you, you're flashing one thing on one side, and you are, you are pulling out the bowels on the other side. Say, Sao Cafe. And Madam Speaker, when we speak about borrowing and taxes, what happened to the two million extra dollars on the Vanna Road? And the member for Cassius South is, he likes it as usual, and that's why I always give that to him. He tells you the thing bold face. So when he says he'll build 10 schools for his wife, you can't say he didn't tell you that. He tells it to you bold face. I give that to him all the time. He ain't hiding anything. He tells you bold face. If I had a chance, I'd build 10 schools for my wife. That, that's him. And he says today, works, works, works. And he smiles. Works, works, works. But I, Madam Speaker, I'm happy as a parliamentarian if works are happening. All of us, everybody around this table. We all want roads. We all need things. When the member for Cassius South East was in opposition the last time, he was the former minister for communication and works. And I saw him on TV when he was in opposition, filling in roles with Barrow. Which means that when he was minister, just a few years before, he didn't do all that he could have done. So it is not unusual that while we're in opposition, we still need things for our constituency. That is something all of us need. It is not unusual. 
He was filling in holes with wheelbarrows, and he had just left office three years ago or two years ago. So if we ask for roads, it doesn't mean that we didn't do any work in our constituencies. There's always need for work. And if roads are being done, we are all very happy. We would hope that we would get works in our constituency, I'm not, and I'm not judging anybody yet, because I've written to the, to the, to the member for Castries of North. I know he's a man who, who, who responds, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I like to be fair. I'm waiting. And I have indicated, Madam Speaker, that everybody who pays the 150, they live all around St. Lucia. The people who live at Bellevue and Grace and Piero, they also pay 150 in the gas. And so I'm waiting. And so when I see people smile and say, works, 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 I'm hoping that the works benefit all of us. Madam Speaker, the truth is, Madam Speaker, we, didn't, we really didn't come here to spend all of this time on this. That, that's the truth. But when the member goes to St. Jude Hospital and they, they speak about, we said we would finish the hospital by a certain date, it wasn't finished by a certain date. Of course we said we'd finish the hospital by a certain date. All of us, all of us, every single one of us, not only those from the South, because the Shaimun Cafe by L'Hopital Sarko, I could say by VA4 to sell. I could say by Labo, we by Shwaze to sell. God forbid, Madam Speaker, but the St. Jude Hospital serves the whole of St. Lucia. God forbid anything is to happen to any one of us anywhere on the South. That's the first place they will take any one of us. So St. Jude Hospital is a, is a national issue. It's not about, when, oh, you need a hospital for Viewfort for this, for that. Of course it's in Viewfort. But St. Jude Hospital is a national issue. And so, Madam Speaker, all of us, all of us wanted to finish the hospital. But this very same government, Madam Speaker, you have also given dates. The Prime Minister was at St. Jude Hospital in June of 2017, and he said the hospital will finish by December of 2017. He promised he promised the, the staff at the hospital that. He said that? He said that. Oh, no, you tell me that. He said that. He, and, I, and I dare him to deny it. So when you talk, when you talk about people giving dates. No, say it again, let me hear it. No, but when he it, said. Yes. Premier Minister Alex and Jude. Where? Premier Minister Alex and Jude. And he did say, Muna, and je. L'année passée, 2017, il dit ce monde, l'hôpital là qui est fini, il y a tout financing, il y a un meeting avec le ministère de Finance, et l'hôpital là qui est fini en décembre 2017. A bref de mon copain. And so when you talk about dates, A bref de mon copain. And so when you talk about dates, I don't believe, Madam Speaker, that members opposite or the Prime Minister and so on. I don't believe that, I don't believe that that I personally don't believe, Madam, I personally believe that everybody wants to ensure that we have a good hospital. So I'm not debating whether this side doesn't want to have a good hospital. I believe you too want to have a good hospital. I believe that. I believe that the Prime Minister wants to have a good hospital. Every single member here wishes for us to have a good hospital at St. Jude. I believe that. I don't believe the reasons they are giving, though. I believe they are trying all kinds of tricks for their own reasons. But the essential point of having a good hospital, I believe everybody, the Minister for Health, everybody, we debate issues. But I believe everybody wants a good hospital. But don't come here and say, we gave dates, and you always do it, and so on. So, but you all gave dates. You all gave dates. Madam Speaker, they were so sure, they were so sure, Madam Speaker, that in August of 2017, in August of 2017, they handed over the mug to the board of the hospital. A confused government, Madam Speaker. They, they stopped works. They stopped works in July of 2016. By June of 2017, the Prime Minister is saying we'll finish in December of 2017. By August of 2017, they are so sure. They are so macho on things. They are handing over parts of the hospital that they say is not good. They are handing it over to the St. Jude board. What, what kind of government is that? You, you, you don't like the hospital. You think it's marshy, but you're handing over the mug to the board? And you're handing over the mug to the board? In August of 2017, Madam Speaker, 
If you stop the hospital, you don't believe it's good at all. How are you handing over a part of it to the board? Yeah. How you hand over a part of the hospital to the board? And in September of that same year, in August, they handed over a part. And in September of that same year, the Minister for Health said, we're demolishing it. So it's very clear, Madam Speaker, that while I believe everybody wants a hospital, this side have their own ideas for what they want to do with the hospital. I, pretty, I believe it has to do with the SH. I put it to you, Madam Speaker, it may have to do with the equine disease-free zone. Maybe the hospital is in the equine disease-free zone. Maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, laugh. Laugh. And so, Madam Speaker, I say to you that the members on the other side continue to give unsubstantiated information. They continue to try to pull a wool over the eyes of St. Lucians. This motion, Madam Speaker, presents no detailed explanations. And I agree with my colleague from Denry North. Of course, we've come to the House before to deal with this kind of thing. And the member for Castry South East and others who were in the Parliament during the last term, remember that. And if you go to Hansard, Madam Speaker, you will see how many lines and pages of, of debate that the member for Castries office has about not coming in details and, and so on. You'll see how many lines, and, and today he acts as if, what are you all calling about? What are you all thinking about? That's an ordinary thing. The Prime Minister said for salaries and other things. Can you tell us the 37 million five hundred thousand dollars on the bank of st lucia presque account million dollar madam speaker we repair the schools well oh i forgot we don't have a curriculum yet because to repair the schools you must have a curriculum utter nonsense madam speaker utter nonsense and that's the kind of thing we have in this country when the prime minister says to repair the schools, you must have a curriculum. That's nonsense. And I say so forcefully as a former teacher, not former, as a teacher, and a former school principal, nonsense. That's what goes out. Six million dollars from the Bank of Nova Scotia. What is it for? Four million dollars from the First Caribbean International Bank. Is it to pay for the infrastructure for DSH? We have to move the garbage dump. Is that what it's for? Is it the garbage dump that they're moving to, to Larry Tret, Grace in View, Fort North, or, in La, or to Labry? Is that what it is? Is it the money to pay for the Zodia? Boss Stadium like Mete and Larry Tuet, Bolo, Vier, Guasla, and two Sabla. Obe SC pour Mete Labo, oui. Madam Speaker, I'm not the one, I'm not the one who introduced, I am not the one who introduced those issues in the debate. But I must respond to them. Is it to build a road that is the, the track that is currently being constructed at the DSH site that will obviously cross the road, which takes people to Grace in View Fort North? And no one, nobody has told the people of Grace where they were going to pass. And the road, the track has actually been graded, sk skipping the road so you can actually see where the track will pass. And nobody has found it fitting to tell the people of View Fort North or Larry Seuss or, or the people who travel that road where they're going to pass. She may have fait a person, monkey call a guas, call a Larry Seuss, mama il call, person, person, gouvernement pour qu'on vini, dis-se moun, 
Zéro blanc, zéro noir, c'est la chimère qui est passée. And people laugh at those things. People just glibly laugh at those things, Madam Speaker. And we are expected to just, as parliamentary representatives, the parliamentary rep of Beaufort South, that road crosses his boundary or his, his constituency, leads into the constituency that I represent. And nobody, Napani Pierce Powell. Can you imagine that, Madam Speaker? I guess those things are, I guess those things are very, very mundane because we are stupid people. We St. Lucians must be stupid people because the Prime Minister and his team can just make roads, tracks in areas that our people have traversed for decades and decades and nobody says a thing. It's like you shut up. You're not part of the 43%. You keep quiet. I urge the government, Madam Speaker, to change course on this matter and to change course in the way they're handling these things. You're talking about people. I can play their government for this moon view for North Flag, you for South Flag. Who is going to be able to do this? Et pour le gouvernement, je ne veux pas dire rien. Parce que nous pas de monde. Nous ne sommes nous, nous, nous plus bas par ces animaux. Et pour ces choses, Madam Speaker, je pense que le record va continuer à show que les membres opposés prennent ça pour Papi Show. Is it, to replace, is it to, to, to replace the water, the water lines and the electricity? Is it to demolish the stadium? L'année moun a les team UWP qui dit que le stadium n'a pas pour vieux fort. Parce que c'est moun qui brise le stadium n'a pas. Ce n'est pas un South Fly qui a été. Le stadium ne doit pas être vieux fort. Because the, the people who matter, the real people don't live down there. But I guess it's for solutions to decide on those things. We, we just report them and remind people of what they see and how they, they think of us. We don't really matter. Even though we produce some of the best athletes in the country and some of the best cricketers, we, we don't really matter. You don't need a stadium. Tio Hacking can just mash that up. And those things don't matter. There is two... $2.8 million, Madam Speaker, from the Royal Bank of Canada. What, what are we doing with it? Is it for medication for cancer patients at our hospitals? The supplies to the hospitals? All of the bed sheets that the member for Mikunov before the elections went to St. Jude and put on, on, on social media and TV and to show them. Have we replaced those bed sheets at St. Jude's? Yes, I remember. I have the record. Have we done that? And... Is that what it's for? The 2.5 million from the First National Bank of St. Lucia Limited. What, what? Is it going to be used for the transfer of Boseju for the 350 acres to somewhere in Miku or, or somewhere like that? Or a new meat processing facility? That they say costs $11 million. And they know that it's true at all. Or is it going to be used to assist the Bermuda farmers even more? Even though you say the exports increased by 200%. I know that ain't true at all. You see, that's the mode of the government. They just say things, hyperbole, and it's going to work. Because our exports of bananas increased by 200% to England. Like the others, I'll tell you, I went to modern preschool, and I know that maths well. So is that what it's for? So it is, it is not as simple as people make it out to be, Madam Speaker. Ce n'est pas un bail simple. Parce que manière gouvernement qui allait to leave people out, to dismiss you, like you, you don't matter. They want us to simply come and just rubber stamp it, even though we have been to the house before. And when those, when those motions came to the house before, 
they were exposed to the same level of scrutiny as the member for Mikunov when she was leader of the opposition. They were exposed to the same manner or even deeper scrutiny. So don't tell us we should just, you know, we're making a, you know, as if we should just pass, pass it. It's our responsibility, Madam Speaker. And I assure you that while we are not against borrowing, we want to ensure, Madam Speaker, that the borrowing is done for the purposes, for purposes that are important, healthcare, and to ensure that the government does not continue to make us feel or try to make us feel as if we don't matter. And all of the debate about DSH and, and all of those kinds of things, that we don't matter. Just keep quiet. And let's see how King come and bulldoze your, your land and take away everything and, and, and take away your beach. They're going to put skyscrapers on, on Maria Islet and all that, that kind of foolishness. And the Prime Minister says, yes. I can tell you, Madam Speaker, that's foolishness. There'll be no skyscrapers on Murray Island. Correct. Not ever. Correct. There'll be no skyscrapers. That, those foolish pictures that you showed, that will not happen. Correct. I can guarantee him that. That there'll be no skyscrapers on Sandy Beach. I can guarantee him that. And just as generations of the past fought for their lands, we are going to fight for our lands, Madam Speaker. It is a custom of just getting things like it's his supermarket, that he can discard things and do what he wants. There'll be no skyscrapers on Murray Islet. And there'll be no causeway to Murray Islet, Madam Speaker. As the member of parliament for Viewfort North, and as a Viewfortian and a St. Lucian, I'm telling him, there'll be no causeway to Murray Islet. None. So he can say correct as much as he wants. If he thinks he can just yank his way through the foolishness that he's doing, it's not going to happen. Not with our land. So, Madam Speaker, there are times when people need to, you need to draw the line. And the little piece of land I have at Piero that I bought, if somebody just decides to come and put something on it, I'm going to draw a serious line. And where DSH is concerned, and all of the glitzy pictures that I've seen on the beaches that I spent my childhood looking for almonds and running behind Tululu crabs, there ain't going to be no concrete buildings on it. I'm telling you. Amen. So when we come here and the member for Castro South is speak about DSH in terms as if it's Papi Show, they want to Papi Show us. DSH is not a thing about changing the marketing board and give, pri making it private, you know, Madam Speaker. DSH say about sir. DSH say about La Vinu. DSH say about La Vinu. And so, Madam Speaker, I see, as I end, that there are times in politics when there are times in politics when your tenure in the parliament has to be defined by historic moments in the time. There are times like that in the politics. When you have to decide that sitting around this table ain't, ain't worth much compared to what you have to go through if you live the rest your rest the rest of your life in Bellevue or Peru or Greece. The Prime Minister and some of them can live anywhere in the world. Just like they send their children to school anywhere in the world. They don't go worry about fixing primary schools in St. Lucia. Their children don't have to sit and let rain wet them from the galvanized roof, Madam Speaker. And so when you say that, they say, oh, it's a personal attack. Oh, it's a personal attack. It's not a personal attack. It's reality. It's the reality. The children don't have to endure that. Or when the wind rustles through the galvanized teachers are running to get buckets of water to put and i'm not saying it's his fault that's not what i'm saying because schools need repairs throughout the time we did some governments did some i'm not blaming him but what i'm saying madam speaker there are times in the politics you have to stand up in the moment of the time and when i see them publish all the sh i'm standing up in the moment of this time and i'm saying none you see that foolishness they're talking about you see that f and i'm yes i'm visibly upset because your patrimony and your pain. There are times you have to get upset. And you see for DSH and things on Maria Island and on the beach where we played as children, 
where if you don't have a public facility, it's not a public beach there. They are beginning to set the stage to tell you that your beach is not, doesn't belong to you. So if it doesn't have a public facility, it's not public. So it's not yours. They're beginning to break you down, chop you down, to want to eat you up. That ain't happening. That ain't happening. I don't have to be in this parliament. I don't have to be. I don't have to be. But those things ain't happening. These things are not happening. And so, I say, Madam Speaker, that borrowing needs to happen, but all of the debate that came out of it, and DSH, and all of those kinds of things, my response to it is that everything that is St. Lucian, that is what they're attacking. Every single thing that is St. Lucian. And the day will come when every single one of us, those of us who spent this term in the parliament, will have to account, every single one of us. To, to, to our grandchildren and our children in terms of what we did to them with DSH and all, all of those foolish things that we be given over to everybody. Okay. So you all can laugh if you want to. You can laugh. I've stopped laughing. Thank you, Mark. Honorable members, I shall rise and this house will stand suspended for one hour. <clears throat> okay, we just heard from the member of parliament for Viewfort North, Honorable Moses Shabatas, wrapping up the first segment of today's sitting of the House of Assembly, the lower house, which is the first for 2018. The Prime Minister began. Uh, this session of the House by extending best wishes to the nation on the occasion of St. Lucia's 39th independence anniversary. The Prime Minister called on citizens to participate in the efforts of national building and development and to reflect on the progress that we have made so far as a nation. Speaking after the Prime Minister was the Minister for Tourism, who spoke about the record-breaking year in tourism for 2017 and pledged government's continued efforts to advance the tourism agenda. He spoke of the uh, linkages that will be built uh, using tourism and other industries and also the establishment of a national uh, tourism council. He also talked about the importance of village tourism and so efforts will be intensified to establish by the first quarter a village tourism incorporated, I guess a company referring her to a body that will really uh, ensure that, that village tourism gets its fair share. Well, we've come to the end of this first uh, session of the, the lower house. Um, as you heard, the speaker uh, mentioned that the house has now adjourned for one hour, and that's for lunch, and so we will resume at about uh, 10 past 2 in the afternoon. We thank you for viewing this first segment of the House uh, via the National Television Network and look forward to rejoining you at about 10 past 2. <laughs>